All right, the things are set and good to go. You know, I didn't even realize that last night was the, the 4th, because, like, you know, they got the May the 4th be with you, Sam. Oh, yeah, I always forget about that. I'm not really a big Harry Potter guy. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was, that was... Uh, got him. <laughs> uh, I feel that, Sam. I, I really do. Because, like, uh, well, on, on one hand, like, I did catch the last episode of The Bad Batch, and, you know, yes. what an episode, you know? Like, what's, what's The Bad Batch? It's a the, little the, Star Wars. The War final trilogy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a Star Wars spinoff uh, that's all about, like, uh, this uh, squadron of. Uh, defective clones and like them being defective basically makes them the perfect uh, iteration of the the classic D, &D style five man band and the the only thing i really like cared about in star wars was like when the clone wars was out you know yeah, that yeah. was really good and then there was that uh that new show i guess that had like the the samurai with the the like laser oh, visions yeah oh yeah they did a couple that, good things with Sam, with the uh, <laughs> star wars visions but then others are just like it, it either leaves you wanting more of a specific thing or like oh uh, there was just a never do that again <laughs> yeah yeah we just don't talk about it yeah fair enough fair enough But hey, you ever try a Star Wars campaign? Uh, didn't we try one a while ago? It, it was a while back. Like, I remember making a character for one. Uh, I, yeah, I got the rules online for it. But you know what? Before I go off on a full tangent like that, how about we just start the show? <laughs> yeah. Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, laser swords, and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Welcome back. And uh, we got ourselves an awesome guest this week. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, so I'm Lucas, uh, but most people know me as the Norse DM. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, I got to see some of your work online uh, recently. It's like, uh, could you tell some of the audience a little bit about uh, what you do? Because I, I know you're on like a bunch of different platforms. Yeah, so I do a little bit of everything. Um, my main goal is to teach new players uh, how to play and, and give new DMs some advice to get their players more involved in their campaigns. But I also go off a little side ta tangents and do you know funny stories from my decade and a half of playing um i've also currently got a homebrew campaign going that i'm very slowly posting on youtube mm. uh we've done two sessions so far right nice oh no love that that was it oh it disconnected Why'd it have to do that? What did? Oh, maybe I got disconnected. Critical error? What you mean? <laughs> Gotta love when that happens. Well, shit. Eventually, I will be spreading out, but there's so many monsters in 5e yeah. to, that are interesting that I want to work through. So right now, I'm still on that. It's I feel like it's hard to make something that covers everything as much as you want to. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Fair enough. 
like that's you know that's what i tried to do here you know to talk about kind of the obscure monsters that maybe people don't know or don't you know know a lot about I, a I heard cool. of some uh, real interesting stuff when i was like uh, going through youtube the other day like a like a pie fiend a pie fiend yeah it's a it's a fiend that it's all like pies and shit <laughs> which is which it sounds silly as fuck but like at the same time like we all know the nefarious uh, trope of uh, s- some uh you know evil uh, little lady that's slinging cursed addicted pies and like ca- causing all kinds of stuff like uh, yeah when when the cherry pie turns you into a slave like that, that, that's a little <laughs> sketch i mean i i kind of imagine there's like demons and fiends for like everything right like yeah i mean like really what wouldn't someone trade their soul for i mean obviously uh the the biggest exception is like a klondike bar because like mm-hmm. nobody wants those unless they're like crunchy those suck <laughs> <laughs> i mean I maybe like, i'm, I'm like not big on chocolate but like <laughs> it's really not that special yeah, it's just an ice cream sandwich, vanilla ice cream covered in chocolate. <laughs> That's all it is. It, the, the thin crust of it just melts so easily. How do we, why are we talking about Klondike? <laughs> <laughs> Would you trade your soul for a Klondike, Sam? No, absolutely not. I wouldn't even go to the store and buy one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real test on how good a product is. Like, Are you willing to inconvenience yourself? to go and obtain it in the first place there's like tears for me i feel like like is it worth even buying like am i just gonna like walk past it in the store you know and then it's like would i steal this or like would i pay for it you know hmm. would, would you like, steal some dice would you sell some dice would you buy exactly. something All right Fair enough. Fair enough. Not that I endorse stealing. We don't. We don't endorse crime on this podcast. Yeah, stealing is bad. We, unless it's we are law-abiding citizens. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the one uh, theft in D and D that I will not abide is like uh, someone taking advantage of a DM's goodwill and just robbing an entire magic item store. Oh my god. Oh yeah, that's a good way to get a uh, the big bad to show up a little early. Yeah, and- I remember when we had a we had one player in my last game roll really well, like really well, and stole like a magic sword, and then <laughs> he ended up using it like the entire game. Oh yeah, like a oh one of the things that happened with that was uh, one of the uh, the player that initiated the theft ended up dying shortly after oh yeah yeah so like uh, the rest of the party's just kind of like coasting on that. He stole some really good stuff and then immediately died. <laughs> you, you know that that's uh that's karma. Like that wasn't oh, yeah. even like uh, you going out of your way. I didn't. I didn't. I specifically put like a monster over there just to fill the space on the map. I was like, <laughs> oh, this seems thematic, you know. Like and he was like, I want to fight this five-headed goose. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> People don't know how vicious goose geese are. Like the yeah, the Canadian attack mean. goose is a very supplemental replacement for a guard dog. You know what? That's a good question. What is like we've all had to kill a player, right? Or had a player die. Mm. So like what sure. what's like the funniest or best way you've done it? Um or mm. that it's happened, you know. Um I was running a campaign as a one shot for for my buddy's birthday, yeah. um, and they were fighting. See, they were fighting a young dragon, and it tried taking off. And my buddy was playing an orc barbarian. Uh, my wife was playing a half elf rogue, and he decided it was a good idea to throw her at the dragon that was trying to <laughs> fly away. Um, <laughs> the classic. Oh, no. Misses the dragon completely, uh, and she goes just careening off the cliff. Uh, and the fall damage just 
instant killed her. Just was, took her out. Yeah, that was all oh, she wrote. So, <laughs> and ever since then, uh, my wife won't play with that buddy because she doesn't trust him not to throw her character <laughs> off a cliff. <laughs> Oh my God. There, there is a protective measure that people don't uh, usually utilize in D and D against uh, being part of the fastball special, and that's making your character overweight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not a viable option with a half elf, unfortunately. <laughs> Two hundred and fifty pounds of fat elf. <laughs> Try yeah. throwing this, buddy. The thickest elf you've ever seen. <laughs> 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 Where does all the weight go? To the ears, of course. To the ears. <laughs> <laughs> that is just a cursed mental image. Please no. <laughs> What's that anime that everyone's freaking out about? Fearin or whatever? Oh, Fearin. Yeah. yeah. I finally sat down and watched that because my you wife was going good? all through it. You know. What is it like actually about? Uh, it, it's, it's kind of weird as far as anime goes, because, like, it kind of hits that, that area between adventure, nostalgia, and, like, slice of life, but, like, a, it plays itself off as a very just kind of, uh, low-key kind of chill going through its paces, meanwhile there is, like, action and stuff going on. Yeah, I heard that, like... The story is that, like, she's from the original party that, like, defeated the Demon King, you know. And she has, like, a yeah. weird thing with emotions. And, like, well, is like, realizing yeah. that the guy that was on her party was, like, in love with her or something. Well, it kind of makes sense. I mean, there are certain races in most fantasy settings that just live for an obscenely long yeah. time and like really long. I, was like, I would imagine right. there is a certain amount of emotional detachment that comes into play there and i've seen some people role play it pretty well and others are just kind of like uh not not even bother with it and you know to, to each their own yeah but it's just like, i think it's a good, something good personality for uh development but i think it's becomes tricky not to create like a bland character yeah, because like, uh, it, it's easy to be like, okay, I want a, my character to be very kind of detached emotionally, but like, you have them like, just... like yeah. yeah, it's kind of like when I played uh, that Warforged character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like he was yeah, trying they... to understand emotions, which yeah. kind of made him endearing. Right. Yeah, otherwise, you fall flat like plank here. <laughs> that is true he, he's very two dimensional he's got the thousand yards there <laughs> I don't know uh, Luke what do you think of the uh, of uh, long lived races and role playing those you know I think everyone should role play their characters however they want mm. but as far as it goes depending on what the age of their character is there should be some kind of um it's a word i'm looking for crassness some some kind of mm -hmm. distance from their short-lived party members like if you've got an elf that's that's running three or 300 years old and they're running with a party of humans that are all in their you know mid 20s to 30s mm -hmm. there there definitely should be like a mm -hmm. an air of distance there between the party members because yeah this elf seemed their friends come and go, and now they're making yeah. new friends with what is essentially children to them. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I've seen I've seen that happen, and I've also had players that have run their super old elves as if they're kids with the humans mm. and halflings and mm. and what yeah, have you. Yeah, definitely. And and it works to some extent. Um, there's always going to be some kind of disconnect when when you're playing that long lived of a race mm. uh, comparatively to your to your party members. So, I think it adds a uh, adds a good chance for like role play, you know, between like, the wise and like distance, you know, between like a young naive. 
you know what? It kind of reminds me of like uh, the relationship that uh, teachers have with their students. Because like, if you think yeah. of like uh, the lifespan of a long lived race, like an elf, for example, versus like uh, the shorter lifespans of uh, kobolds, goblins, and humans, it's just mm -hmm. like it's like being a teacher. Because like each generation, as far as a teacher concerned, is like a one year. That's a new crop, new class of students. And sure, you might get like a little investment, but there's always going to be a level of detachment because you know that they're just going to move on to the next thing next year and then you're going to get a new crop. And it's like sometimes you just you're just going to end up fucking up names because you've seen people that look exactly like them before. And it's just like, you know, you're six months into the school year still uh, calling uh, uh, Chester uh, AJ or some shit. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's got to be weird, like, being a teacher and seeing, like, generations of kids, you know? Yeah. Like, imagine being, like, so long-lived that you know family members of your uh, uh, party is like, oh, yeah, and you just keep referring to them by, like, their grandfather's name. See, it was kind of like, because I had another character that I played for, like, one or two games where it was a, uh, a Tricera, you know, and they're really old. And he was probably like three hundred years old. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, and he he had like the um, the knowledge domain, I believe. So I made him like very like old and wise and like, <laughs> oh, you were all so young, like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that made for a good dynamic because like uh, the character I was playing at the time, Stormy, was just very youthful, energetic, and kind of like uh, all over yeah. the place. And it, it, like, fit because you were also playing, like, a character that would have, like, a short lifespan in comparison to him, right? So, like, you created, like, a really nice dynamic, I think. Oh, absolutely. So, Luke, what kind of, uh, of all the stuff that you've worked on for your <clears throat> your content creation, what, what would you say is your favorite thing that you, like... Um... My favorite thing is is ragging on rules that I personally don't like. Um, <laughs> my biggest one is I really hate spell components. Um, yeah, I think they're nonsense. Them, like... Yeah, like I don't I don't understand why like for fireball you have to have some bat guano to use it. Um, yeah, doesn't doesn't make sense. And so I personally don't run spell components. And I love it when somebody goes, "Oh, so you can just do like." Is it Soul Prison requires a um, silver cage to, to use right. it? It's like, well, what do you do in that case? Well, I have my players role play it. Yeah. You know, they describe what's happening instead. Um, so instead of the soul being trapped in the, the silver cage, they describe it like uh, an ethereal green glow appears in, in the shape of a cage and, mm -hmm. and traps their soul or, you know, something to that extent. Right. Um, and it's like, I don't like fall damage rules, but that's just because I don't like calculating fall damage. It's not difficult. Yeah. It's just yeah. irritating. Um, so that's my biggest thing. And those tend to do better, um, yeah. which is great. Because I'm, but I'm running out of rules to bag on. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a little difficult. I mean, because like Five E objectively is considered of mo out of all the D and D editions to be the most rules light. Yeah, it's like Five E is pretty balanced for the most part. I feel like it, it, it's objectively not that bad. But I, I kind of like the I've I've said it before and I'll say it again. Like I, I always like the bare bones of it because like I've played other editions of D and D, so it's just like. I'm just going to take all the stuff that I already have uh, jumbled around in my head for D&D &D rules, throw it in where applicable, and I have myself whatever I need on the fly, you know? Yeah. I think that's a good way to, to run any campaign for, for any tabletop RPG, really. Um, I always, before I run a new tabletop, um, I go over the, the rules and that way I've got a guideline of the way it's supposed to run. And then a lot of times I'll change smaller rules just to make it like run better, uh, more yeah. fluidly. And I I personally think that's the best way to, to run any campaign. 
Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like the homebrew bastards rules are by far the best rules in my opinion. Oh yeah. Homebrew bastards. <laughs> well, if you bastardize like a bunch of systems until you got something that your table likes and you're good to go. Mm. True, true. Let's see, what's a rule that I don't like? <laughs> like how they do like condition combat, you know? A lot of them I feel like they should do more. Kind of <laughs> yeah. And there should, I feel like there should be more. Like the differences between like being knocked prone and like being like immobilized and incapacitated. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think they could do a little yeah. more with that. Uh, they, they can and have in the past. Like in uh, 3.5, there was the <laughs> flat footed condition where it's just like you lose flat. your dexterity bonus to your AC. Mm. You know, you catch someone off balance, well, all they got is the armor on their back keeping them safe. And for some characters, that is detrimental, and others, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. But, uh, Sam, what you got for the monster this week? Yeah. Um, So, originally I was thinking about going to, like, the Shadow Plane. Sam. (laughs) Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking about this, and, you know, been lazy for the longest time. And finally, mm-hmm. I think we might have a stinger for this. Uh, tell me how this is. Let's try this one out. Unveiling the darkest secrets of the creature of the week. <laughs> Sam's Monster <laughs> I, I could let it solo out a little bit longer, but <laughs> I thought that was fun. That's pretty, pretty nice. I like it. <laughs> mm. But yeah, originally I was gonna, you know, head to the shadow plane and pick a creature from there. I was looking at like bats and stuff. I, I like you make bats. it sound like you're going to the store to pick up something. Like yeah, oh, I was going to the shadow plane, feels. pick up no, like, I, a bats and a Mountain Dew. I kind of, it's kind of how it feels when I'm picking like a monster for this. You know, I'm just like, what realm do I want to like touch on today? What kind of like species mm. am I looking for? You know, yeah, what what are you in the mood for? Right, but. You know, I saw something in like the footnotes of a page and I was like, ooh, what that? You know, <laughs> I was like, look at this freaky little guy. So I picked this one instead. <laughs> mm. Is it this something is that we awesome. can actually have a real IRL fight score? Because most of the stuff you bring in is just like, nah, man, I can't fight that shit. Maybe. Maybe. M- Probably. Maybe. Okay. Uh, I'll take maybe. maybe. All right, so these are called Malagrim, I believe. Malagrim. Yes, also known as Shadow Masters and, rel- and collectively as Clan Malag, where immortal and evil shapeshifters who clash with many of Farron's greatest heroes. These shapeshifters were superior to many, if not other, races, both physically and mentally, in their natural state which they almost never revealed, they appeared as a spherical mass of rubbery flesh, kind of like a beholder, uh, about four foot, 1.2 meters in diameter. This form had three yellow eyes, a beaked mouth, and three tentacles, each tipped with a hooked claw. They hovered in the air with the tentacles constantly writhing. Okay, so you said it's a malagrim. Go pull up a picture of that. Because I've got to see what this looks like. Because that, that, that's a crazy description. So it's kind of like a like a beholder in that it like has ah. you know the three eyes, but it has like a beak mouth and three tentacles. Okay, kind of like a like a like a diet squid beholder. Yeah, kind of. When transformed into the shape of a humanoid or other creature, that forms eyes would have an extremely faint yellow glow. This was often the only indication that the person or creature was, in fact, the Malagrim. With concentration, a Malagrim could suppress this glow, becoming completely undetectable without the aid of me. Okay. So, you know, we do love to give DMs, you know, (laughs) 
interesting ideas. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, I can see some ideas already kind of cooking up right here because yeah. you're, you're saying okay. that, like, it's going to disguise itself in, as, like, mm -hmm. a, a typical person, and then maybe if it decides to reveal its true form, things heat up. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I'm going to get into the ecology here a little bit. So reproduced malagrooms would adopt a form necessary to mate with a human and then steal away with a newborn to be raised in the new malagroom. While malagrooms did age and could grow old, they could not die of old age. However, other malagrooms were killed. Oh, older malagrooms were killed by younger ones eager to usurp their power. In general, the only sign that a malagroom was getting old was gradual memory loss and the decline of its cognitive ability. So the entire Malagrim hierarchy is like, oh shit, Grandpa's gotten a little senile, <laughs> time to off him. Grandpa's cooked, let's get him. <laughs> I mean, it is kind of like the, the animal kingdom, like, you know, usurp your father type of deal, right? Like <laughs> that, that is a classic trope for a reason. Mm, pretty funny. Could do so with Malagrim... the uh, Oedipus uh, stealing the mother portion of it, but you know... Uh, it, it seems like this one's got that covered. Yeah. I wonder, like, I didn't really find, like, what it said it did with them, you know? Like, if it killed them after, like, let them go. I guess you can kind of, well, you know, it, choose whatever you want. I kind of case. assume that it's just, like, a... well, it says that it just steals the child. So, like, yeah, they, they can transform, so the... The most practical thing for them to do would be to transform into like a, a dude because like you know transforming they're probably like some kind of like pretty close to asexual like not really yeah. too concerned about having a gender outside of their transformation so they go in uh, they, they they knock a girl up they, they, they take the baby and while she's incapacitated from you know giving birth wonder... they're just out See that makes me it makes me wonder because like what if they just turned into you know like a woman get you know get pregnant and then they leave like you know that'd be a lot that, easier maybe that's kind of what it means yeah that'd be, that's maybe. a lot more discreet yeah just, then it's just kind of like oh okay it's the girl dipped. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, a, a Malagrim goes into a bar, uh, uh, finds someone. Uh, don't worry, it's a safe day for me. Ooh, okay, so now imagine, like, your party is in a tavern, right? <laughs> are, you, are you saying what that you... the bard is going to father a Malagrim? Yeah. That's what it sounds yeah. like. That's how I it love it. Goes. Yeah. <laughs> now we're cooking. Yeah. <laughs> Find out later that it stole the bard's baby, and then everyone's oh. like, "Oh shit! <laughs> you they got your kid, later, bro!" And you're like, "Wait a minute!" <laughs> <That'd be crazy. laughs> I I love monsters like that. Anything that can disguise itself is is fantastic no, in my books. So One hundred percent. So I like having uh, evil dragons be uh, in charge of certain cities. Yeah, and sending adventures on quests that could be like bad because they don't know they're just doing what the the leader of the city told them to do. Yeah, but in reality, it's an evil dragon in disguise. So yeah, he's like yeah, setting like, you up to fail. Yeah, yeah. any I intelligent believe, uh, monster that can transform is great. I think green dragons are notorious for seizing political power over cities. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like, damn, that that's a pretty solid idea. Like. If you want, if you're a green dragon that wants to expand your territory, just convince all the heroes in the city that you control that they're doing the righteous thing by attacking another dragon's territory. Yeah. Oh man, really? that's how you get them. And this works great because apparently uh, Malagrim desired power over the material plane and schemed to conquer all Faerun as well as collect as much magic and as many magic items as possible. They were particularly keen to find magic that could help them traverse the plains, but which could ensure their continued immortality. They All had right. few, if any, allies, even among each other, and would compete amongst themselves for the chance to wreak havoc on lawful or goodly societies. Individual Malagrim would prioritize their own schemes and goals over the well-being of their fellows, which often undetermined any progress or their grander evil plan. 
I could imagine a Malagrim just having a couple bags of holding just to send some adventures to the astral plane once they uh, oh get a little God. too close. Like, you got enough time to figure things out. It's like, forget about it. Dude, you could have, what if you had, like, a Malagrim infiltrate and join your party? That's like, Ooh, and it. then it takes all the magic items. It's just like, you know, this, this NPC has some good magic items to start with. And, like, in the middle of the night, it takes your magic items and just jets with them. He, like, sabotages, like, fights and situations and stuff in, like, subtle ways. Well, I had something similar happen where, like, a, a there was a character that infiltrated my player's uh, camp by, uh, well, it wasn't exactly pretending to be dead, but it, it was dead. But my brother was very, he thought he could get away with keeping the body for his own nefarious purposes. And then, <laughs> like, a, this happened to be the big bad who had a bad habit of re. Uh, getting back up after dying because you know far realm bullshit right and so uh he was being kept inside their bag of holding opens up the bag of holding crawls out takes that stuffs it with more magic items and runs with it damn and meanwhile the rest of the party was pretty distracted with uh the uh all the gold that exploded the airship so <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah right they had so much gold that the airship like couldn't carry it or something yeah one of the players used a wish oh my god and wished for the treasure from uh that uh the water deep uh module oh. <laughs> Fun. and it broke the oh, hole <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yeah the ship just cracks in half. <laughs> well, they're set money wise now, so yeah, you can buy a new a airship. Hercus. You can and, pay for your hospital bills. I guess. And then they had to go through the process of like hiring the town to shovel all the money into a bag of holding, which was connected to like a vault, and trying to hide uh, all the extra money they just got from their boss because the boss takes a cut. Oh. <laughs> There was a lot of corporate bullshit because it was like a acquisitions incorporated style game. But like, oh yeah. So, while they sought power and food on the material plane, their main base of operations was the Castle of Shadows on the Plane of Shadow. However, they were not native to that plane. So Malagrims were never a numerous race and were more akin to a large family, sometimes referred to as a clan Malog. Family or no, Malagrim's desire for power meant that they were constantly undermining and trying to one-up each other, sometimes killing <laughs> their rivals or superiors, and even waging centuries-long vendettas against each other. <laughs> so, like, Cousin Venny was rude to me one time, so I'm going to have to spend the, like, the next hundred guy. years kind of fucking him over. <laughs> <laughs> was like, I buried him alive three decades ago. <laughs> He got out, but like you know, that'll that'll teach him. <laughs> <laughs> While powerful individual Malagrim were respected and feared by their peers, they technically had no hierarchy save for the one recognized as their leader, known as the Shadow Master. This title was held by whichever Malagrim had been strong enough spellcaster to claim it from its previous owner. The new challenges for the title were issued every few decades. <laughs> decades. It was suggested that only their Shadow Master, perhaps those spellcasters, were strong enough to become Shadow Master, possessed by the power of interplanar travel necessary to reach the material plane. Hmm. Well, I think that right there, as far as any campaign goes, that kind of writes itself. Yeah. You, you deal with one, okay, it's part of some kind of clan, and uh, before you know it, like... You're you're in deep trying to take all the magic items from these creatures that hoard them. Oh, that's cool. Sometimes they're referred to as the Great Shadow Master or the Shadow Master Supreme. Mm. Can't go wrong it's with dope. Supreme. It's like the, <laughs> it's like the best pizza. I don't think I've ever had those pizzas. Oh, you mean like the pizza? Yeah, no, I don't like that. <laughs> oh, you don't like a Supreme? Nah. I think vegetables should stay away. 
<laughs> That's fair. Except, except for like olives, I might I might let those slide. <laughs> well, they use those to make oil, so they're going to slide. <laughs> so, as such, Malagrims were constantly trying to gain favor with the Shadow Master in hopes of being able to pursue their goals on the material plane, okay, making so the Shadow Rattlers. Master. <laughs> Basically, making the Shadow Master the only being with the influence to convince Malagrims to cooperate. Somewhat confusingly, any Malagrim could call themselves a Shadow Master without actually holding the position, and many of them did. Like, <laughs> they're like, no, 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 is is me? I'm him. Like, <laughs> this is fantastic, uh, lore-wise, because like, say your players are trying to be like, okay, we've arrived. We're finally going to battle the Shadow Master. <laughs> oh, sorry, Mario. Your princess is in another castle. <laughs> You're like, oh, what? That wasn't the Shadow Master? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, maybe some of them tack on, like, extra little bits to their title. Like, you got Shadow Master Supreme and, like, Omega Super Shadow Master. <laughs> <laughs> the ultra shadow master <laughs> so the legends of the Malagrims claim that their race was descended from the human wizard Malak said to be the first person to enter the plane of shadow he became warped by shadow magic gradually transforming into the first of the Malagrims the Malagrims further believed that their race's mother was an alien being from the far realm encountered by Malak in his travels Malagrims were thus easier, sorry, eager to travel to the Far Realm to search for their supposed parent, and in doing so, to acquire more power. Although they dwelt in the Plane of Shadow, Malagrims considered the Far Realm to be their own. The Far Realm is a crazy place. Like, there's very little it, that's actually you know, properly written about it in D and D. Yeah, and, you know, I did a little, like we did an episode a little bit on the Far Realm, and like it was just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard weird. to it's hard to explain and it's, it's hard always to research like, like uh, the far realm played a big part of that campaign i was talking about earlier and like yeah. even then when i tried to research it there was not much to go on because like yeah it's it's eldritch nonsense <laughs> like yeah and i mean i imagine they really do feel home there because there's like creatures like them you know there's the hundred holder species and variants like and they're kind of similar, like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, like, like I said, hey, it's it's Eldritch weird nonsense. Business. Hey, you know, Eldritch nonsense is a lot of fun. I and open-ended it. stuff like that where there's not a whole lot of lore, you get to put your own little spin on it every time exactly. you use it. So. Yeah. It kind of circles back to the bare bones are best bones. You know? Exactly. Like, if you got that going for you, you can build a house that has, like, a loose structure. Just gotta be ready to, you know, put it all together. Yeah, well, improvisation is always key, you know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> a great way to kind of keep things from going against like whatever canon you establish if you're establishing the canon as it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember to take your own notes. You'll be all right. Yeah, <laughs> I forget to do that a lot. That's why I've started recording campaigns. There it's you like, go. That works too. Video, don't lie. <laughs> And it's actually come in clutch a few times because like I'll be going through uh, some of the stuff like oh wait a minute I did say that write that shit down. <laughs> and that's why I've started uh, actually making character sheets for all my NPCs instead of just throwing random names in my notes. So now I know exactly who is what and what they can do, and I won't get tripped up ten sessions later. Oh, absolutely, and one. One of the things that I find that kind of is really useful, like if you want to have like a really fully fleshed out like stat block for a character, but you're like on the fly and just you don't want to like put all this stuff together and completely make it up either. Like if you have like a chat GPT uh, tab opened up, just be like, hey, stat block for this character, the X, Y and Z traits uh, about this CR. It like it's surprisingly good at generating stat blocks that way. Is it really? Oh yeah, absolutely. Give it a shot. Like I uh, use it for writing 
friend. That's about it. <laughs> uh, I tell you, like, ChatGPT is surprisingly familiar with all kinds of D&D stuff. So it's just like, okay, uh, I need a creature that matches this description and uh, about, like, you can tell it a general CR and it will, like, generate, like, stuff that's kind of based on the average of what a CR whatever should have. Now, like, everyone knows that CR is kind of a sucky system to work with, but oh, it's, it's a good baseline when you're using ChatGPT to get, like, a roughly the power that you want. Yeah. Cause I, think it's, I think the scaling works in some avenues. Yeah. Because, like, you can wing it from that point forward. Yeah. It's just kind of like a little supportive way of winging it. So... Most folk of Faerun had never heard of the Malagrims, as their existence was very secretive. The first recorded instance of Malagrims living in Faerun was in the 3rd century DR, when a young elder clashed with the Malagrim Undarl. This was, in fact, the Malog in disguise, and the Malagrim progenitor was never again seen following his defeat at his hands. Man got wrecked and hit his face forever. <laughs> hey, you know, when you get your ass beat, it's time to hide. He was like, oh, shit. <laughs> These humans are cooking. We gotta get out of here. <laughs> He's in the L protection program. <laughs> so, Malagrims were said to be perfect shapeshifters, able to freely adopt the forms of any creature, object, or person they wanted, as well as to transform individual pieces or parts of their bodies at will into whatever they wanted. The only known limit to their ability was that they could not assume the form of deities. Most Malagrims had two favorite forms, a normal semen human form in which they could freely travel among the people, and a more monstrous form which they reserved for combat. Uh, at least some of their shape-shifting ability was illusory, as a Malagrim's form never inhibited his abilities. Malagrims retained their ability to fly, even while transformed into flightless creatures as well. Okay. So even when they're transformed, you could like totally misdirect to them being something else entirely. Yeah. Like uh, now you, you have one of these flying around. Good. Someone's like, "Oh shit, that wizard's already casting fly, so he's got concentration on that." If we break his concentration, and mm -hmm. like the, the players are like strategizing around that. Meanwhile, it's got another concentration spell all cooked up and ready to go. Just a thought. No, oh, definitely. Well, when in doubt, just throw your half elf at him. <laughs> the fastball special is the place to be. Okay, let's get into their abilities here. I wasn't really able to uh, get a like a stat block or anything because I believe they are like a two e three e creature. You know, so you know those conversions can be a little tricky. Yeah, you know, what is fortitude and reflex? Yeah, yeah literally. <laughs> so they were astoundingly agile, far beyond the kin of a human, as well as someone being somewhat stronger and more hardy than one. Their remarkable durability was in part due to their tactic of constantly shape-shifting during battle, often very subtly in order to move around or hide vulnerable sites or vital organs. Even out of, outside of combat, many would regularly manipulate their bodies in ways in order to make themselves more difficult targets for ambushes or add, you know, weapons or things like that. Uh, their primary goal in most fights was to conceal their true nature, and in most cases they preferred to flee rather than to be forced to reveal their true forms. Okay. So if I was to fight one, I'd have to, like, you know, kind of corner it and get it to run away. Yeah. And then, like, it'd be like, oh, fuck, fuck. I guess I'll have to... About all the stops. <laughs> like, I, I, I so, guess so. Malagrims were notoriously quick to recover from wounds, which would seal up on their own with time. They were furthermore impervious to all weapons, save those which were magical or silver. Blows from silver weapons were particularly devastating and left wounds that the Malagrim could not heal naturally, instead requiring magic healing. Malagrims were also resistant to magical attacks, particularly from less experienced and were further immune to all poisons. Malagrims also had combat training as wizards, although it was not unheard of to encounter sorcerers or clerics. In battle, they would make use of these skills when they wished to conceal their identities as shapeshifters. Otherwise, they would morph parts of their body to the tentacles or pseudopods to strike. Hmm. 
Despite how formidable they were as individuals, most Malagrim preferred to avoid direct conflict until victory was assured. Instead, sending minions or pawns to engage their enemies and using traps or illusions to battle their foes. Owing to a human heritage, Malagrims could not be banished or removed from the material plane. Uh, so that that's sounds troublesome. <laughs> that's a, that would be a oh moment. Like, oh <laughs> shit. Like <laughs> I've seen so many people use that as a last ditch effort. And it's yeah, just like, like oh, nope. banish get it, get it away for a minute. And like, nope. I picture it just kind of looks at you and it's like Let's try. <laughs> yeah. Bitch, I'm from here. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it would be a lot of fun to use, but really hard to balance the encounter on. Yeah, it would, it would be strong. I don't know what kind of pawns it would have. Maybe like magical controlled like people, like charmed or whatever. They'd probably just have a bunch of people that it talked into being part of, part of its crew. Oh my god, you're gonna have its own party. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the Freyrin oh, uh, situation. Well, they prefer you know? to be it alone, lives right? so long, so it's got uh, a per- like it could be like a guild master perpetually replacing a its pawns. Guild. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that would be rough. That is all for the I guild have. master. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one last quote from a Malagrim that states. But don't you see, or don't you agree that praise is even better than spice with the sweet tang of fear? So, so. Hmm. spooky balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know uh, about fighting one personally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give that like maybe like a three. <laughs> a three? That's saying you think it's easy. No, okay, then in that case, like a seven. Okay. <laughs> uh, what would you do to fight one of these, Sam? Uh, okay, so I would have to, like, catch on that it's a transformed, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, like, it's, like, it's, you don't have to catch it, like, it's eyes glowing or something. Okay, like, so, like, a, you, you figure okay. it out. No, uh, knowing me, right? I would probably, like, I'd be like, this isn't who I think it is. You know, I'm not going to let him know that I know, you know. So I'm going to I'm gonna go for him while he's in, like, the human form. Yeah. And then if he runs away, you know, and then transforms, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. If it has magic, I'm going to be cooked immediately. But, like, that would be, like, my only stipulation is if I can catch it while it's, like, in its human form. I feel like. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, what do you think, Luke? Could could you fight one of these? <laughs> um, <laughs> it'd be rough. Um, with a party, we could probably do it. Um, I'm I always, no matter what, at the beginning of a campaign, as soon as I have any kind of money, I get silver weapons as quickly as possible. I I think that's something people so, definitely don't. Like, yeah, I, I do yeah. feel that. Like, uh, last campaign I was in, like I'm like, okay, I, I got some silver, and I got a gun. I'm gonna make some silver bullets just in case. <laughs> yeah, there's just, there's so many things that are either immune or resistant to non magical, non silver weapons. Every weapons are far easier to get the magical weapons, so why mm-hmm. not just get them as quickly as possible? Better yeah. safe than sorry. So I would definitely have a leg up there um, against the Malagram, but it would still definitely be difficult. They they sound very <laughs> Very strong. Um, I'd probably fight it to get it to run away, and then once it runs away, I would just nope off in the other direction and hope it doesn't find me. <laughs> so, what what I'm thinking is like, uh, you know, you got your traditional battlefield. You know, you're like a you know little fisticuffs and stuff. Uh, I'm thinking that I could convince this thing for a totally different kind of fight. Mm. Convince it to fuck instead. <laughs> they, I they, mean, they transform. So if I, I already got that suspicion uh, going on in this login, hey, you know, you, you do you. Yeah, yeah. Look, 
<laughs> Bardley things. We don't we don't talk about Bardley things. You know, it's it's mind your business. You know, you want to be that exactly, bard. You, exactly. Be my guest. You know. And if you know uh, you're doing Bardley things, and uh, one thing leads to another, and it eventually runs away because, like you know, you're, you're doing your thing. Ba boom, victory like, is a mine. Win is a win. <laughs> so you know, exactly, a win is a win. Now th this thing's probably been around for a long time, so it it'll be a difficult fight. It'll be a very difficult <laughs> fight in the it would, it would be tough no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like a creature like this, you know, it's going to it's gonna want to have control of the situation mm. you, at you, all you times. Think they got that dommy mommy vibe. <laughs> they're, they're not going to want to be you know, submissed by a human, at least. Uh, like, I, you know what? Maybe, uh, you know, <laughs> you could talk them into it. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah the the crux of my argument is i go about that way and slip them uh 20 gold to fuck off afterwards i mean you may not even have to they, they, if you get the job done they're leaving on their own you know <laughs> <laughs> boom got him the real question is will your party ever let you live that down yeah. <laughs> Would my wife ever let me live it down? <laughs> I did it to save my life. You don't understand. They weren't who I thought. I they was were. coerced. <laughs> they used magic, I promise. <laughs> yeah, you know, you do what you do. <laughs> all right, Sam. Is that all we got on those guys? That is all I got on those all right. guys. Well, we do. I think they're fun. I think yeah. it leaves a lot of opportunity. That, you know, really someone does. out there could be like, <laughs> you know, the, they they're plotters, they're schemers, they got family. The the misdirects are everywhere. So, I highly encourage DMs that haven't tried these to just kind of like give them a shot. Like, yeah, give them a little look. See, you know, I always try to encourage. You know, looking into the the less talked about, <laughs> less used realms to kind of like find your creatures. Yeah. Mm. Or, you know. And as far as like CR goes, like it's just ambiguous and powerful. So just I do be believe a little, bit, little bit stronger than your party. Yeah. In the one like stab lock that I was able to see, it did place them at around like a CR four. And I think that that seems, you know. Yeah. Moderately same, normal. At the same time, assuming he doesn't items, have, so yeah, yeah. Assuming he doesn't have any crazy items or, yeah, you know, you just kind of like a, take a roll table with a bunch of like magic items and see where it goes from there. But imagine your party raiding a Malagrim stash. Okay, that that'd be crazy. Yeah, that could be that could be interesting. But moving on, we got nerd news, Sam. Oh hell yeah. This is TNF, bringing you Nerd News. So, this week, uh, from Dicebreaker, D&D Maker says it doesn't publicly address every AI allegation to protect artists' privacy. You know, mm. you know what? That, that That's a way of wording it. Like, they, they could have just said that they just don't want to address every issue because they... You know, they done goofed. They yeah, fucked like, it a little bit. They're like, you know, we 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 don't we don't want to out our artists. You know. I mean, the fact that they're using the term artist and AI uh, in the same sentence is gonna it's gonna set a lot of people off. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, it, it it's weird. Like, you you know me. I've been fucking around with uh, some. Uh, AI music stuff lately because I think it's fun to make uh, songs about people. <laughs> oh yeah, I I heard you made one about me actually. I I, I did. Uh, I'll play it at the end of the show because I thought it was really funny. All right, all right. Although the, the one I'm really really proud of is the Trailer Park Batman. Trailer Park Batman, so yeah. Yeah, Trailer Park Batman. Dude, I <laughs> did you watch that video that I sent you about the Trailer Park Aliens? Uh, not yet. I, I kind of forgot about that. There was just such a long it's, shuffle of things this it's week. It's so funny. 
to anyone who may know, there's a there's a video. It's like a song of like a trailer park, and there's like some aliens that like break down or whatever in their yard. It's pretty funny. It's, like government shows up. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems like, as far as uh, Watsi is concerned, though, like every week or two, that's a new AI allegation, and like it, it's just something new. Someone notices like a, some kind of art mistake in like a, a card or like in a book, and it's just like I don't think they're actually trying. So, like, maybe we should just stop pretending that. Uh, you know, if they're going to do it, they should just either be all in or all not, you know? Yeah, they're like wishy-washy. Well, this way they're kind of digging themselves in a hole. So it's they have no choice but to double down on what they've already started because of how far they've dug themselves. So Yeah. yeah. But nobody's buying what they're saying anymore. So I don't know. It, it's weird because, like, some of the artists are... The, I think if you're going to use art and be doing things of that level and in using AI for that, at least if you're going to lie, be good at it. You know? <laughs> that you know, is if true. You're, if you're going to take a shit, just at least have the decency to bury it. Cover your tracks. Wipe after. Wash your hands. Yeah, you know, the, the whole process, because it, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily Watsi's job to cover up for all these people every single time. No, they could be like, hey, you know, our, maybe our artist, you know, did, it's not really like, you know, even if we don't endorse it, it is what it is. I don't know, that... It's just ridiculous. Like it keeps happening. So either, either just check over your stuff better, or just yeah. it just it just doesn't seem that hard to. You're either either all against it, or you're good at covering up, and it just seems like they they can't even do that much. I don't know. If you're going to lie, just be good at it. Because like wise words. <laughs> I'm just so used to Watsy lying about everything. I mean, like, we started this podcast around the time of the OGL debacle, just like hitting the uh, internet waves and such. So, <laughs> our entire time, every time there's news, it's just, it's always Watsy is doing <laughs> something, <laughs> lying about something, <laughs> sending a, a hitman after people. <laughs> We don't want to have to talk about Watsi, but come on, so they do uh, it to themselves. Uh, honestly, Watsi, I'm tired. Give me some different news. But speaking of different news, uh, there is something interesting happening. Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, World Anvil? The uh, that yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, little online platform where dungeon masters can like kind of uh, create a whole big old like a like a wiki. Uh, kind of work uh, thing that all of your world building countries characters and all, all this stuff like just for being able to kind of build up your world and setting and then easy access for players and such sure well they are doing a uh, once again their world building awards for 2024 so I didn't know they did awards I, I didn't know that either until uh, just recently I got an email about it, and it's interesting that like most uh, nerd sites don't that we use for getting our tabletop news don't cover any of this stuff. Yeah, and I mean we can definitely expect us to cover like the winners and stuff if it's on well, our. We'll see you where know, it goes, you know, because yeah. uh, a lot of DMs use World Anvil, and they're having an entire contest to be like, hey, who is the world builder of the year? Uh, they got different categories and prizes, so that's cool. Ooh, so prizes. people that have really put their heart and soul into building a D&D campaign might be pleasantly surprised by just uh, entering their stuff in, and who knows, if uh, you got something good, maybe it'll work out for you. 
That'd be awesome. Yeah, they make you like an official like book or something. Publish it and everything. Yeah, they got uh, participation badges, uh, a short list of works for nominees, and you know winners for multiple categories, a physical trophy, and trophy, uh, and a spot <laughs> on the World Building Awards showcase page. So. Being Ugh. highlighted for your world building, like if your DMs appre- if your if your players appreciate what you've done with using that, and that happens to be something that you've used, maybe maybe some of the DMs out there will uh, enter in their stuff. Can't hurt. And that is going to be judged and done on. Let's see. So, submission phase through yesterday to the seventeenth of this month so Uh nice and then first round of voting is going to go from uh march 20th to april 3rd okay wait oh did did i get the oh wait okay so the submission phase has already happened and the awards ceremony is on the 18th okay The, the information was all kind of jumbled there so we can expect award uh announcements later this month awesome nice yeah we'll definitely cover that you know talk a little bit about it for sure but th- that's about all we got for nerd news this week nerd news. <laughs> <laughs> all right what you got sam like a for the homebrew yeah you want to do the homebrew yeah do the homebrew Send us to the generic realms. Uh, the generic realms. Generic realm, generic realm, lots of fun, excellent. Oh. <laughs> it's, uh, Luke, are you familiar with the generic realms, the the, the place where uh, everything canon in D and D and homebrew coalesces into the most generic of campaigns, where anything is possible? You know, I'm not, but it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, the generic realms can happen anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so here at the generic realm, we like to search the internet and the, the pages, you know, for homebrew that kind of stands out to us and kind of gives some 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 love to the artists and to the creators. Yeah, yeah you know, the, the small content creators that put out the homebrew for yeah. people to just enjoy. So shout out to Dungeon Scribe on uh, Patreon. Ah. I bring to you guys the Devil's Grin. Oh, let me just uh, pull a, that up on the yeah. recording here. Yeah, it's like a like a half like samurai demon mask, you know, kind of gold with like a sm- like a smug kind of grin that goes all the way back to like the deep cheek. You know? Oh yeah, okay, okay. Little half mask thing. It's cool. Yeah, I like it. Looks like it gives you the infernal language, uh, proficiency on your deception and your persuasion, plus two to your charisma. It is a very rare item, required attunement. It says man can hardly even recognize the devils of his own creation. I like it. So, uh, the off putting nature of this mask only seems to be noticed when not worn, causing most common folk who witness it to not give it a passing glance. For others, the odd sharpened silver teeth and tusks jutting out of the golden mouth give pause. The hairs on the back of the neck give rise, begging one to steer clear of this metal grin. The user must attune for the mask to be worn, the assembly having no straps or buckles. Grants plus two to a charisma to a maximum of 20. Grants the ability to speak and write in Infernal. User gains proficiency in persuasion and deception. If they are already proficient, if they are already proficient, they gain stayed, gain expertise. Nice. Expertise in persuasion and deception. Oof. <laughs> that, that, that's uh, some big stuff right there. Yeah. When worn through a long rest, user has 50% chance to grow a pair of tiefling horns. If they already possess horns, they would double their initial length. Nice. If attunement is broken, the horns will wither and chip away, leaving scars to forever mark their presence. After, so it has a curse, apparently, to it. After I a week of attunement, curses. I also love curses. 
After a week of attunement, whether the user is offered a bargain or deal, or whenever the user is offered a bargain or deal, the target must succeed on a DC 10 wisdom save with disadvantage. On a failure, the user will agree to the deal bargain on any terms and strive relentlessly to complete without rest. By two per week attuned, resetting on a failure, a full week passes before reactivating. Only a devil can remove this curse. Okay, that's a very interesting caveat there. Oh my god, you end up having to have a devil make you a deal to remove the curse? <laughs> Requiring a deal with a devil, okay. That... And at that point, you may have just have to agree to it. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, I'm very happy that that item both has attunement requirement and a curse. Um, a lot of time I go through homebrew magic items for my campaigns, and... Yeah. There's so many of them that are just like really powerful with no drawbacks whatsoever. Yeah. And it's like, I can't even use those. There's no point to them. Uh, so it's great that it's got an attunement requirement as well as a curse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that curse just sounds like a lot of fun to, to abuse. Yeah. Yeah, like absolutely. Like, I, I love just the concept of there's only one way to remove this curse and i feel like a lot of dms struggle with putting curses in their games because like yeah, because you have to have a way to you know break the curse at some point right like, well yes but like, or at least a way to curse it. comes online very early in most yeah. games like you you get it's a third level spell if i remember correctly and Something. it's just like okay well the, the curse is removed I imagine that only works for like the most basic of curses, like uh, or I curses feel, inflicted yeah. by like spells. Yeah. Yeah, I, I once had a, a curse uh, removed by the players by using the spell and uh, a ritual kind of uh, with it, and when they removed the curse, they had to put it into a new vessel. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like that's usually how it should work, and that's that's what I meant to bring up earlier when we were talking about uh, material components. You know, I definitely agree that a lot of spells can kind of like go without them, but I feel like uh, like rituals and stuff. It's very thematic to have the components. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that works. Now. Yeah, like any the resurrection spell should be ritual only, and it should still require its components. Uh, yeah. Maybe not the component, if I remember correctly, or it requires like a diamond of, of a certain value. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of a weird one. Uh, but it should definitely be ritual and require some components on, in that particular instance. You yeah. shouldn't be able to just do resurrection on a stick. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of like maybe something that held value to the uh, target. Yeah, yeah. something personal. It's like, oh wow, the he only carried one thing, and that's the sword on his back. I'm sorry, bro. We're gonna to have to sacrifice your sword to bring you back to life. <laughs> Motherfucker, that that was like the best magic item I ever had. He's like, I'd rather be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I like the idea of like you know having a sentim a sentimental value. Oh, definitely. But yeah, I like that. I give that I give that an item a ten. I would definitely use. Would definitely give to a player. Like <laughs> <laughs> ten out of ten would curse a player. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, curse a player is always fun. <laughs> mm. Recipe just... stonk. He's forever yeah. cursed. <laughs> I, I feel that. Like uh, maybe one day we'll uncurse the stonk. Um... Look, all, all right. curses are removed in death, you know? I mean, <laughs> unless it's an undead curse. Then, oh, yeah, you know. there you go. That's when it gets interesting. All right. So this week in, uh, you know, in the conjunction with all the Star Wars-y uh, stuff. Right, right. You know, it's basically Star Wars week. We get it once a year. Oh, damn nerd. Yeah. We got the ancestral laser sword. Nice. Yeah, you know it's a not your traditional lightsaber. Kind of looks more like a glowing Buster sword ish kind of a design. So that's cool. But it says here like the uh, weapon is an antimatter dagger laser half sword laser sword. Okay, well 
very futuristic, but you know, that's kind of a, that's the vibe. Mm. Uncommon requires attunement. Passed from generation to generation, mm -hmm. this blade remembers each master who has wielded it. When you roll a one on an attack roll using this weapon, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. Living weapon. Uh, the weapon grows in power as you gain levels. At fifth Love level, that. you gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this weapon. This bonus increases to a plus two at 11th and a plus three at 17th. Nice. Ancestral property. Uh, when you find the laser sword, it has a property determined by the wielder that carried Ooh. it previously. The GM chooses the sword's property or determines it randomly. And there's a little D6 roll table here. I like so, that. Yeah, I like the idea of, like, it could change depending on who wields it. So, like, say uh, you have a, a, a character die, and then one of the other party members takes up the weapon. The mm. magic of it will change. Yeah, it, like, takes on, a, like, a property of that party member. Yeah. And, yeah, that would be really cool. His spirit kind of lives on through it. Yeah. yeah. And like you t could totally flavor it up that way. So let's yeah, see. Uh, first on this little D6 roll table is blind sight. So while attuned to it, you have blind sight to a range of 20 feet. Within that range, you can effectively see anything that isn't uh, behind total cover. Moreover, you can see an invisible creature with that within that range, unless the creature successfully hides from you. A little caveat there. So not perfect blind sight, but pretty good. Okay. Right, let's see. Communion. When you spend 10 minutes communing with spirits of the sword, its previous wielders, oh, that is flavorful as fuck. That's like the Avatar state. Nice. You can choose the Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature, Religion, or Technology skill and gain proficiency with this skill until next dawn. And your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses that proficiency. Mm. Okay. Yep. So temporarily guided by the spirits of the those who've wielded this before. I like that. Then number three, we got covert. While attuned, you are when you are hidden and a creature discovers you with a successful perception check, you can attempt you can reattempt your stealth roll. So on a success, you silently reposition yourself and the creature doesn't notice you. Nice. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again for a long rest. Nice. Okay, that that's actually very interesting. I could see that being very useful mm -hmm. to, like, say, uh, the clunky the paladin character. of the party that has a oh, low yeah. chance at being able to stealth. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's really good. I was uh, thinking, like, you, you give this to, like, a, like, a rogue in, like, a dagger form, you know? But, like, that'd be really Oh, yeah, that's totally doable. Number four is a little uh, shorter. A leaper, while attuned to the sword, your jump distance triples. Which that's just... Triples? God, yeah, damn. yeah, it's basically permanent jump spell. Damn, nice. Which, that's just cool. Then at number five, we got telepathy. So, while attuned, you can telepathically speak with any uh, creature you can see within 30 feet of you. You don't need a language... Uh, to, you don't need to share a language for it to understand your. Uh, to, uh, doesn't you don't need to share a language to, for it to understand you, but the creature must be able to understand at least one language. And I like that these aren't like combat based. Yeah. Purpose. Like it uh, says, flavor wise, it's based on the previous user. Yeah. And then returning when you uh, tune to the sword, it has the the throne range of 40 to 120 feet you can use a bonus action to call the sword uh, to you if it's within 60 feet if it's not if it isn't being carried uh, causing it to fly to your open hand nice I'm sure you could hit somebody with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of just winging this thing at somebody then you like leave it over there and let your guard down and you call it back and hits them in the back of the head or something. Yeah, you know, kind of like uh, Kingdom Hearts with a Keyblade. Never played Kingdom Hearts. Ah, oh, you should. Yeah, that 
that sounds like a fun magical item. Um, it once again, it's great that it's got an attunement because it is a very yeah. strong magic item, but still, it's not something I would probably use personally just because it doesn't seem to have any real drawback past the mm. the attunement requirement. Yeah, it's just kind of like a good, good yeah, weapon. yeah, yeah. It's a good I flavor. Like, item. I like that it uh levels up with you, kind of, too. I think that's yeah. a good thing. I like when weapons have that. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Or like the weapons that like have like awakening, you know, or whatever. Those are always cool. Yeah, I do like those kind of weapons. I think I'd throw this in a game just because it it's neat. I, I like the concept. Yeah, you could flavor it as different weapons. I think it's really cool. Yeah, I think that goes for just just about anything because like, yeah, dagger, sword, don't matter. But shout out to uh, Mage Hand Press who uh, brought this together because uh, they seem to make a lot of really cool stuff. Nice. All right. Well, that's about all I got today, Sam. Same, same. Uh -huh. So, Luke, do you have any like favorite homebrews that you like to bring to your table? Um, not really. I kind of try and use something different every time. That way. My players don't know what's coming. Um, it, I tend to have a lot of the same players usually, so I don't want them to be like, "Oh, we had this in the last in the last yeah. campaign." Um, so I don't have any set homebrews that I bring in. Um, Understandable. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So, where can the people? find you uh, i'm on youtube uh as i think norse dungeon master is the full thing but if you search <laughs> norse dm on that search bar i'll pop right on up um i'm also on tiktok as the norse dm and then i'm on instagram as mm. once again the norse dm so nice. all right oh, yeah. and thanks for hanging out with us thanks for talking thanks, thanks for having me i had a lot of fun yeah it's been great having you <laughs> and as always, uh, for our listeners, if you want to leave a voicemail, we're more than happy to kind of play those on the show. We don't ideas, rants, advice, you name it. We we just recently started that, so hopefully we get some calls coming in. Uh, I'm always excited to just kind of hear what the listeners have to say about stuff, you know. Yeah. Whether it's in the, any the kind of feedback, or, yeah. any kind of comments, you know, would be great. Yeah, emails and whatnot. But hey, uh, this is Dungeons and Talk Shows, and we'll see you guys next week. See you next week.